Despite being originally designed in the 50s, the Buccaneer found itself at the epicenter of RAF ground attacks during the Gulf War. The Buccaneer was given the role of a maritime attack aircraft, although Number 237 Squadron had a reserve war role of an overland laser designator to support the Jaguar in low-level close air support. There were some speculations to whether all squadrons equipped with Buccaneers should be given training in order to carry out the laser designation tasks. However, it was overlooked due to the fact that there was limited space and resources available in RAF airfields in the Gulf. Gulf War commanders saw no need for Buccaneers to be in the Gulf. Normal training continued until mid-January, where Buccaneers of 208 Squadron were on detachment to RAF St. Morgan and returned to their base at RAF Lozimouth at 1900 hours. Then only three and a half later, the commanders changed their minds and the Buccaneers were given the green light to be sent to the Gulf. The Buccaneers and their crews had 72 hours to prepare, so frantic preparation of six aircraft ensued. Wartime equipment was given to the Buccaneers, as well as the iconic pink desert camouflage, seen on the majority of RAF airframes deployed in the Gulf. Their crews got given anti-chemical and bacteriological jabs, they wrote wills, and received nuclear, biological and chemical clothing. At 0400 hours on the 26th of January 1991, with paint still wet, the first pair of RAF Buccaneers departed from Lozimouth. It took the Buccaneers 9 hours to get to the base in Bahrain, whereas the ground crew travelled by Hercules on a 19 hour journey. When they landed, no time was put to waste, as they began preparing close formation sorties with Tornado GR1s. This formed the standard operating package, 4 Tornadoes and 2 Buccaneers. Sometimes these formations were given cover by 2 F-15 Eagles for air-to-air -air cover, and Weasel aircraft, most commonly the F-16 Fighting Falcons or EF-111 Ravens, to suppress the threat of SAMs or surface-to-air missiles. All aircraft had to report into an E3 sentry, which held the capability to use AWACS to telepart all coalition aircraft from Iraqi aircraft, and to prevent the event of a friendly fire incident. Two Buccaneers were used in the operating package, as if one laser designator failed, then the other could be used as backup, so the mission did not have to be cancelled. On the 2nd of February, the Buccaneers flew their first sortie. They flew around a route which was to become commonly nicknamed the Olive Trail. They hit up a tanker and headed towards the Az Suwaria bridge at the height of 18,000 feet. The majority of the route was in cloud before the final 50 miles, which were in clear sunlight. The crews knew that they had been detected by Russian-made, Iraqi-operated radar installations, but to their relief, the E-3 reported that no Iraqi aircraft were present in the area. The bridge was easily destroyed. The Buccaneers accounted for 20 bridges destroyed, and unknown at the time, the Iraqis placed fiber optic cables along the bridges, so every bridge destroyed would cause a communications shortage on the front line. When bombing the bridges, the bridges' abutments were targeted, and both bombs had to explode at the same time, or else the second bomb would be put off by targets by the first bomb's explosion. Another downside of these missions was that the traffic on the bridges had no warning that a bomb was going to go off. However, there was one instance where the ends of the bridge had been targeted by bombs, and the driver of the car was marooned in the centre of the bridge. However, not all drivers were this lucky. A routine was quickly established which consisted of tornadoes and buccaneers destroying bridges over the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, breaking Iraqi resupply lines going to their army in Kuwait. Unlike modern times, the tiled laser designator could not operate at night, therefore only daylight missions were carried out. The navigator had to use a rollerball for 40 seconds between release and impact. The lasers achieved 50% success rate compared to modern equipment. Around a week into the Buccaneers' deployment was when they first encountered a surface-to-air missile. This wasn't as scary as it seemed, as USAF Weasel aircraft would shoot anti-radar harm rockets, which were meant to detonate on the SAM shooting it down. This made the Iraqis very reluctant to turn on their radars, and if they did, had to turn them off quickly. Therefore, the majority of SAMs launched did not track the target properly, and Allied air crews could see when a SAM was not being guided properly. The ground crews helped the Buccaneer forces incredibly in the Gulf. Although the aircraft they were operating on were almost certainly older than them, they still managed to keep them in combat-ready condition throughout the war. When the ground invasion started to gather momentum, the Buccaneers moved from bridge bombing to targeting airfields, and specifically aiming for hardened aircraft hangars or any static aircraft on the ground. 
There was no increased Iraqi airborne retaliation to the Buccaneer attacks, so Buccaneers started to stop flying with AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. After guiding the tornado's bombs onto targets, they took a moment afterwards just to pick off any other remaining targets, which were usually dive-bombing runs, up to a 40-degree angle of attack. On the 21st of February, several Soviet-made AN-12s were spotted on the ramp of an airbase. Two Buccaneers dive-bombed the transport aircraft and were happy to see that the two had been destroyed. On the first aircraft targeted, the bomb did not detonate, however the momentum of the bomb was enough to split the aircraft in half. On the second, the fully fueled AN-12 exploded in a great, fiery explosion, which for the TV viewers in the UK was a delight to watch. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. I hope you have learnt something new and have enjoyed. Once again, thank you for watching and stay safe in these difficult times.